Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I'm Colonel Brendan Kearney. I'm the director of the Living Memorial here at the Marines Memorial. And on behalf of Lieutenant General Jan Hewley, our president and CEO, and along with our board of directors, I'd like to welcome you to our program here tonight. The Marines Memorial is a 501c19 veterans nonprofit organization with a mission to honor the legacy of military service. The Marines Memorial Foundation is a 501c3 organization with the purpose of supporting the association's programs. Since opening our doors in 1946, the Marines Memorial has grown to 19,000 members all around the world. To support veterans and all those serving in the United States Armed Forces, the Marines Memorial accomplishes its mission through three action words, commemorate, educate, and serve through our lines of effort. The Gold Star Honor and Remembrance, Living Memorial, Active Duty Aid and Assist, Scholarships, Education, and Commemorative Events such as this program tonight. Programs including the Meet the Author series are only possible through the generosity of our members and donors. If you are interested in supporting the Marines Memorial by becoming a member or donating, I encourage you to speak with a member of our staff here tonight. Our next events include a Meet the Author program with Dale Brown on Saturday, August 10th, and also General Jim Mattis participating in a George P. Schultz lecture series in mid-September. As we begin this evening's program, I would like to ask you all to please place your phones on vibrate or be subject to whatever is appropriate humiliation that is called upon you. First of all, a, a couple quick questions, and if I ask uh, a question, I'd like you to stand. Uh, do we have any USS Indianapolis or family members present here this evening? Are there any here? Okay. There we go. Stay standing. There you go. Good man. World War II vets present. Korea. Vietnam. Please stand if you if you can if you can feel like standing. All right. Cold War. Any calls? Keep standing. Don't sit down. Panama. Or the Gulf War One and our on toing our ongoing efforts uh, over there now. How about our allies? Lieutenant Commander Kita. Please join me in a round of applause for these veterans and their families. You can go ahead and sit down now. You get a Marine up here in front of a microphone, you know it's going to get loud. I'd also like to point out that we, honor, we are honored tonight with the Vice Council General of Japan and his associate, Fukuma Keisuka. He's a Lieutenant Commander of the Japan Coast Guard and his associate, Jeffrey Fleischman. Thank you for being here tonight. Now, you all know within the programs, the way we do things here is uh, if you have a question, the questions will be entertained at the end of the presentation. Uh, the way you do it is fill out. We've left a pen and the question card uh, on your seat. Uh, you fill it out and just simply raise our hand, and what we will do is we will, your hand, and we will have one of our uh, employees come by, pick them up, and they'll be passed to the authors here at the end of the program. What we'd like to do right now is show a quick video. Mackenzie? I started into the Navy when I was 16, and I saw all 10 battles. I saw the flag raised in Mount Sarabachi. And I personally helped load and unload the components of the atomic bomb. On the 30th of July, we were hit by two torpedoes from a submarine. Suck. Next thing I know, the ship's going right out from under me. I never did know how to swim, and the Navy never taught me how to swim. And here's all these sharks going around. Come right across your legs like that. It was chaos. We couldn't understand why we weren't rescued. A lot of them lost the will to live. This guy decided, well, hell, that's where we're going to die. Then there on that uh, fourth day. I said, I hear a plane. And we began to splash water. We began to yell. We began to pray everything. And, and seemingly, when he got to a point that had he gone any further, he would have gone over. But you know what he did? 
He made a dive. How did I make it with nothing to eat, no water to drink, no sleep for five nights? I tell him the Lord was with me. If somebody wrote this up as fiction, nobody would believe it happened. People don't realize the politics in the armed forces. All the headlines were about the captain being court-martialed. Many a head should have rolled before they ever got to the captain. It's the story that's not been told. Those don't want to remember. They don't want to recall this. It's too much. But I'm a dummy. I think it ought to be told. As far as our, the authors tonight, Lynn Vincent and Sarah Vladek, their bios are in tonight's program. So I'd encourage you to peruse those at, uh, at your leisure. Theirs is an absolutely masterful effort. I read the book this weekend and it is absolutely superb. I'm not gonna tell any of the stories out of it because no one's gonna tell it like them. So will you please join me in welcoming Lynn and Sarah to this evening's presentation. Ladies. Test, test. Hello, hello. All right. <laughs> oh, we can yell. <laughs> well, first, I want to thank you all for being here tonight. And I just kind of want to start things off by asking who here has heard of the story of Indianapolis before tonight? Oh, so we're good. Then we can go. They know that. <laughs> um, who heard of it the first time in the movie Jaws? Well, I heard about it the first time, I was about 13, and it was in a documentary about World War II, and they reduced the story to the description. It was the ship that carried the bomb and sunk, and that was it. And I thought, wait, the bomb that ended the war, and that's all you're gonna tell me? I need to know more. So I was that kid that went to the library and looked into it, and this was before the internet. And I wear a lot of makeup, you can't tell. Um, <laughs> but I went to the library and I still I couldn't find anything. I started searching for any books about the end of World War II, the Pacific, and there really was no mention of Indianapolis. Uh, there was a couple books that had been written in the, in the late 60s and in the 70s, but they were not available in the library. So I thought, well, I want to find out more. And maybe someone will make a movie about this someday but I didn't know at the time that it would be me. So when I graduated from Pepperdine several years later, I looked into it and I said, well, no one's told this story yet. I think I wanna do it. And I could probably do this in like a year or two, tops. Like every 21 year old thinks they can conquer the world in two years. We're now here 17 years later. And <laughs> um, in that time though, I thought, well, I'm gonna reach out to the survivors and see if I can get a hold of any of these men. And so I reached out to a gentleman by the name of Paul Murphy, and his grandson is actually here tonight, but Paul Murphy was the first person I spoke to from the Indianapolis, and he said, well, why don't you come to a reunion? And so in 2001, I went to my first reunion, and I have been to every reunion since, and I started meeting these men. I started talking to them, and they were my heroes. I mean, they probably didn't know what to do with me. I was this 21-year-old who was so infatuated with their story and the heroism and what they did, and I just wanted to be around them and learn more and honor this story. And so a couple years later, they said, well, we'd really like you to be our storyteller. And so that's, that's kind of when it officially started. I began interviewing the survivors of Indianapolis and over the next 11 years interviewed 108 of the survivors and rescue crew and traveled across the country and did this. And this whole time I was doing these interviews in order to write a screenplay because I wanted to make a movie. 
And with this movie, you know, wrote the screenplay, had it all ready, we took it to a major network, and they said, this is the best thing we've seen since Band of Brothers, but it needs to be based on a book. And I was like, <laughs> I don't know how to write a book. I write screenplays for a living. And so I decided, okay, I need to talk to family and friends or anyone. Where do, you know, I need to find someone who can give me advice on how to get a book started. And so I reached out to actually my mother-in-law who had had this lovely lady named Lynn Vincent come to her book club and speak. And at the time, Lynn had written books like Heaven is for Real, Same Kind of Different as Me. Um, I believe at the time you had eight bestsellers, six, ten, many, many bestsellers. I was totally intimidated. And um, I decided, you know, after 16 drafts of an email, I finally decided, okay, this is the one I'm going to send. And I sent it. Well, what she didn't know is that uh, she didn't know I was a Navy veteran at the time. She also didn't know that I'm a Christian, and I had been praying for two years by that time, and these are the words that I would use. God, I want to write an iconic World War II story. So imagine when I open up this email, and there's this iconic World War II story that's sitting there in my email box, and I was like, yes, God has answered my prayer. And then I was reading it more closely, and it said she just wanted advice. So I was like, how can I manipulate this young lady in letting me help her? <laughs> but the truth was, as, as we began to talk, it turned out that we both had a, a really similar vision of the story, which Sarah, uh, Sarah's going to tell you about. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it was really important to me to honor these men, honor these heroes. And... Um, I come from a military family. I served eight years in the Navy as an air traffic controller. My husband's a retired senior chief. Our son now is serving on the USS Truxton out of Norfolk. He's an STG-1. And if you are Navy here, I just have to brag and say he made first class in four years. What? E6 for all of you Army people. <laughs> So we decided to team up. I had some books that I, I was actually working on an army book, um, one of my books called Dog Company, and I needed to finish that up before Sarah and I could get started. Um, but finally, um, after several conversations um, and deciding that we were simpatico, we decided to meet. And I still remember that first meeting. I was actually very nervous, but I also pictured, you know, based on the books Lynn had written, I had this vision of her showing up with a sweater set carrying a Bible. And I, I don't know why, <laughs> but she showed up on a Harley. And I was like, yeah, like, <laughs> this is going to be great. And so, um, and it turned out it was. We were very compatible. And in writing, you know, the process, we both had our areas of strength. But we really just meshed well. And we would, you know, swap stories and both write our part. And I couldn't have asked for a better writing partner. Here we are. And, you know, we both had this vision, as Lynn had mentioned, that we wanted to restore Indianapolis to her rightful place in history. You know, prior to this, she really had been reduced to the sinking story or the bomb story or the shark story, but nobody knew that she was the flagship of the Fifth Fleet. So it was from her deck that battles like Okinawa and Iwo Jima and you know, much of the Pacific were commanded from. You know, she was Admiral Spruance's ship. And before that, she was Roosevelt's ship of state. And so she was the first ship that carried an acting president out of the United States. And everyone loved this ship. Everyone knew about this ship. And so to see that she was only known as a sinking story or as, you know, this one quote in Jaws, it was, we, we knew that we needed to give her back to where she was in history. And so to do that, we started going into the story of the men. You know, we went into, into the shoes of these young men, these teenagers, 16, 17, 18-year-olds, as they left their farms for the first time, as they went off to war, as they saw, you know, something bigger than a tractor, as they would say, for the first time in their lives. And, you know, here's this 600-foot, 610-foot-long ship, and she's magnificent. And most of them saw her for the first time right here over in Mare Island. And, you know, a third of the crew was brand new on the final mission. So these were young kids going there and seeing her. Um, we also wanted to introduce the Japanese perspective. And to do this, similar, similarly to the Indianapolis story, we did this by reading letters, by reading firsthand memoirs, 
And by getting these accounts from these people of what they saw, of what they heard, of what they smelled, everything, firsthand experiences, so we can put you in their shoes to understand what they were fighting for, why they did it, and to see the similarities and the differences between the two sides. And so it was really quite a privilege to be able to tell that story, especially of the kamikaze pilots that had not been told prior to this. And all of this, you know, like I said, with the letters and um, giving voices to the lost at sea, the men who, you know, 879 men did not come home from Indianapolis. And for the first time, we were able to use the letters and the stories from loved ones to give you those firsthand accounts of those men and to make them real people so you understood the gravity of their loss. So we opened the book at the very end of World War II. Um, we open in uh, March of 1945. Uh, we are just about a month out from Adolf Hitler doing the world a favor and shooting himself in the head. And so VE Day is imminent. Um, Iwo Jima is still being fought, and Indianapolis has moved on to shore bombardment at Okinawa. Um, on March 31st, 1945, Indianapolis is struck by a kamikaze, and nine men are killed, and a couple of dozen are um, wounded but the ship is catastrophically damaged. And had it not been for that kamikaze, Indianapolis would never have been in the position that she was, that she later became. Um, so instead of being able to repair her in the forward areas, she has to come back here to Mare Island, and she arrives here in May of 1945. No, April, April of 1945. And um, so she is quickly repaired, and as Sarah mentioned, about a third of the crew turns over. So there's all these really green sailors and really green officers, and they were just churning out officers and sailors in droves in those days to staff the war. Even though everyone knew that the war was on its last legs, they still had to staff it. So some of these uh, men who reported to Mare Island had literally been on the ship for days or maybe two weeks at the most, when Indianapolis gets its gets call for its final mission. And that mission is to transport the uh, uranium core of the atomic bomb to Tinian Island. And what's interesting about that is um, that story had never been told before. We were really shocked because there are, there's a Pulitzer winning book about the atomic bomb, but the actual journey on Indianapolis uh, of those parts was never told. And we were just so privileged to come across the letters and personal papers of a man named Major Robert Furman. Furman was the head of intelligence for the Manhattan Project. And um, he told in really specific narrative detail about this transport mission, which took place, interestingly, before President Truman even knew whether he was going to use the bomb. Um, the ship sailed on July 16, 1945 from Hunter's Point, and there were women, wives of the crew, that dashed out to Presidio Park to try to say goodbye to their men, because that was kind of the tradition. That's what they would always do. But by the time they got out there this time, the ship was already gone, and the wives would later say that they knew that something was up, that this was a mission of a different kind, because normally they wouldn't get gone so fast. So Captain Charles McVeigh III, the skipper of Indianapolis, had been told, you've got this secret cargo. The faster you get it to Tinian Island, for every day that you get there faster, that's one day off the war. But the interesting thing was that he didn't know what the cargo was that he was transporting. All he knew was that there were these two Army officers, Major Furman and Captain James Nolan, and they impersonated artillery officers. And they, kept, they had this big crate loaded aboard Indianapolis out here at Hunter's Point. And um, that they made a big to-do, a big show, out of putting this crate on the ship. And it had all of these misleading army quartermaster symbols all over the outside of it. And so everybody's attention was focused on that. And while that was happening, Major Furman and Captain Nolan carried these two canisters aboard and put them in the admiral's quarters. And they were like two what they call old-fashioned ice cream buckets. None of us here remember old-fashioned ice cream buckets, probably. Oh, I see some nodding heads, yeah. <laughs> I have no idea what she was talking about. <laughs> so, um, 
so, uh, so those things go into the quarters with the two army officers. And um, Indianapolis leaves Mare Island, or Hunter's Point July 16th, 1945, and makes a record-setting speed run to Diamond Head, 74.5 hours. That's still a record that stands today for that class of ship. And then um, they head straight north and west to Tinian Island. Um, actually, south, yeah? North and south to, uh, south and west <laughs> to Tinian Island where they drop off the components of the atomic bomb. And you would think, you know, with this giant mysterious crate being placed onto the deck and all the men's attention on it, that they would think something, you know, ominous was in there or something very dangerous. But these were young teenagers, and so we were told that they would start taking bets. And, you know, they bet things like it was Rita Hayworth's underwear for a USO show, or it was, you know, scented toilet paper for Douglas MacArthur. And so <laughs> these young men had all these bets going around, and needless to say, none of them got it right. But they, um, what was also interesting is that, you know, we're here at the, the Marine Memorial Association, and you know, many times the Marines are overlooked in this story. And there was a complement of 39 Marines aboard Indianapolis. Um, they, you know, the purpose of Indianapolis was speed and to get the guns to the shore as fast as possible. And so the Marines were in charge of this. They were also in charge of, gu of guarding the bomb. And later, um, Edgar Harrell, Mel Jacob, these young Marines who survived would say that that was a, an enormous point of pride for them to be the guards for the atomic bomb that would ultimately end the war. And the number of men that would come to them later and say, I was going to be at the invasion of Japan. We were getting ready to go to the invasion of Japan. And because this happened, I want to thank you because I wouldn't be here today. And so this was very important to these Marines. And it was very prestigious to be a Marine aboard a Navy ship in World War II. And they picked these men of certain stature and um, height, actually. They said they had to be very tall. And it was kind of, you know, a neat thing. And they were very honored to be chosen to serve aboard Indianapolis. Well, that whole thing about the stature, also fitness and being squared away. You know, I was a sailor. And when I was in the Navy, we didn't have these digital cami uniforms like they wear today, you know, that look really neat and trim. What we had looked like the Shawshank Redemption. I'm not making that up. We had, does any, but did anybody serve enlisted when we had to wear the Shawshank uniforms, the, the long, the bell bottoms and the chambray shirts? Well, when I went to A school for air traffic control in Millington, Tennessee, there, the Marine Corps Air Traffic Control School was co-located there. So all the Navy, all the sailors, they looked like hell. They had wrinkled shirts, high water bell bottoms, and all the girls, who did they want to go out with? The Marines. <laughs> so the, these Marines and sailors, they went to Tinian, and then they were to Guam. Well, after they delivered these materials, they were told that they needed to report um, for further orders at Guam, and then they would be heading to the Philippines in order to receive additional training. As Lynn had mentioned earlier, they were very, very green, and they Captain McVeigh was really wanting to get them you know, some kind of training before they would go into the invasion of Japan. And what's really important to realize here that we failed to mention is when Indianapolis went back to Mare Island for repairs, everybody on that ship was like, yes, we are not going to go back to the front again. We're not going to go back to the forward areas. We're done. We've done our duty. We've made it through the war. And of course, then they got that those orders. So um, Captain McVeigh was saying, geez, at the rate we're going, I'm going to train my crew in Tokyo Bay um, because I'm not getting this refresher training. Before, before they got the bomb assignment, they were going to go down to San Diego and get this refresher training. But as it turned out, they delivered the bomb. They go back to Guam. Now they're set to go to Leyte, Philippines, and it's just a routine training mission. And Captain McVeigh is told, hey, this part of the Philippine Sea, no problem, nothing to worry about, everything's safe. I mean, he was literally told by commodores and admirals, there's nothing to worry about. And so as a result, he was um, sent to Leyte, Philippines without an escort. How many of you are familiar with the destroyer escort program in World War II? So there are a lot of you who aren't. 
So a cruiser had no underwater sound detection. So when it would go on voyages, typically it would be assigned a destroyer or a destroyer escort, which is a separate type of ship, to accompany it. And that way, if it fell under attack, well, first of all, the, D, the destroyers and the DEs, they had sonar. So they could detect if there were any enemy submarines. But a cruiser didn't have that. So, but that, you know, McVeigh, with what he had been told that the area was safe, he wasn't really worried about going without a, a destroyer escort because he'd sailed solo before. And um, what he also was not told was that there was a quartet of four Japanese submarines that were headed down on an intercept course with Indianapolis. The reason he wasn't told is because that uh, intelligence came in classified top secret ultra. Well, all of you who are veterans here know that intelligence is useless unless it gets out to the, f the fleet and the forward areas. And so it was supposed to be sanitized and, and distributed, but it wasn't. And so on July 26, 1945, Indianapolis headed westbound across the dead center of the Philippine Sea. Now, this is midnight, and it's pitch black. And the orders at the time were that you could zigzag, which was a tactic that you, was used for Japanese submarine evasion. And it was up to the crew, after McVeigh went to sleep that evening, whether to continue zigzagging or not. And it, zigzagging was very disruptive. So the, you know, as you imagine, it's literally zigzagging. So it's rocking the ship. And McVeigh said, if the moon is covering the, I mean, if the moon is covered and it's dark, you can uh, see zigzagging and let the men get some rest. It was also very, very hot. And so men were sleeping up on the top deck. And it's just after midnight. Many had just gotten off shift when the Japanese submarine I-58 surfaced. And it just happened to be that that is exactly when the clouds broke and the moon shone down on the ship. And Commander Hashimoto saw Indianapolis. And it was heading right for him. And so he, he said, get ready, prepare the torpedoes. And just after midnight, he fired a spread of six torpedoes. The first torpedo hit the Indianapolis at the 12th frame. It blew off the bow and it blew it, so it was just hanging and serving kind of as a rudder. The second torpedo hit right below the superstructure and this was where the ammunition stores were. So this blew through the ship, this knocked out all the power, this knocked out all communication and Again, they're in the middle of the Pacific. The clouds are now covering again. It's pitch black, and nobody really knows what's going on. They know they've been hit, but many said it sounded just like when the kamikaze plane hit. So they didn't know the extent of the damage. Protocol at this time is to get out of there. You know, if you're hit, there's an enemy, get away. And so the men in the engine room who have no windows and have no communication and no way of knowing what's going on say full steam ahead. They don't know that the bow is missing, and it's all this water is going through the bulkhead, breaking it down, and the bow is it's going down by the bow. It's starting to tilt, or I'm sorry, list to the starboard, and it goes to a 90-degree list, and then the tail goes straight up into the sky. And men are trying to get out of these compartments, trying to get to the surface, and some start abandoning ship immediately. I mean, as soon as they see the bow is gone, they know the ship is doomed. And then some will go all the way until that tail is right up in the sky and it's sinking down and they're jumping the last minute. And those in the water that got away, when they turned around and saw the silhouette of their ship against the moon, they said they could still see men jumping off the ship like ants on a stick. And so it went down and this all happened in 12 minutes. So we've been talking much longer than 12 minutes. Imagine you're totally asleep in the middle of the Pacific. Next thing you know, you're swimming in the ocean, all alone, many of the men were spread out. He said by the time the ship completely sank, the men were spread out over a mile. And over the next five days, they would be spread out over 25 miles. And so they were, they were cast into the ocean. Only about 30 men out of the 12 or 1,195 that were on the ship actually were able to get into a raft. The rest were either swimming with life jackets or nothing at all. Some were on floater nets, but they were really spread out and with 12-foot swells in the ocean, some thought they were only the only survivor. They didn't know if anyone else was out there. And because of that separation, I, I think of the eeriness, what it must have been like, you know, if any of you have served aboard ship, it's a noisy place, you know, and then you're out there alone in the middle of the Pacific. The water's about 80 degrees. 
it's pitch black. Maybe, maybe you're all, literally all alone. Maybe you're just with a few men. But I, I just think of what that must have been like. Interesting, interestingly enough, some of the men said they were actually very optimistic, which I think is a really interesting reaction. But the reason why is they, had, they knew that they were expected for gunnery practice in Leyte on July 31st. They were sunk on July 30th. So they thought, OK, as soon as the Navy realizes that we haven't shown up, they're going to send rescue. All we have to do is you know, hang on. What they didn't know was that when they departed Guam, there were errors in their departure message. So no one knew that they were coming. People, some people who did know didn't pay attention. And so there, there, there were these, this mounting uh, combination of negligence and incompetence that ultimately meant that the men stayed in the water for five nights and four days. So uh, that first night, uh, becomes daytime on a Monday. And the sun comes out. It's a beautiful day. But guess what? They're not in the water alone. And this is one of the most famous things about Indianapolis. And you know, we didn't want to make this a shark story, but it is a part of the story that, that has to be told. And so that Monday morning was when the sharks first started showing up. And um, What's interesting is that in the South Pacific at that time, the water was clear for about 50 feet before it became opaque. So when the sharks started showing up, they didn't show up by the dozens or the scores. They showed up by the hundreds. And the men said that they could look 50 feet straight down and see those sharks circling like tornadoes. And they said that they, the sharks would reconnoiter and just graze by their legs and um, that uh, sometimes, as you remember from the Jaws monologue, they would cluster together in tight groups, and the, the sharks would come up, and you remember what Captain Quint said. You know, they would holler and pound and scream, and sometimes the sharks would go away, sometimes they wouldn't go away. And there were really, really horrific stories about the shark attacks. Um, one that we particularly remember was this man named uh, Eugene Morgan. He was on a floater net, and he said he saw maybe from here to the wall some about a dozen men on another floater net, and a whole bunch of sharks attacked it, attacked it, and it was just fins and froth for about a minute, and then there was nothing left. And this happened over and over and over, these blood-curdling screams. There would be your buddy next to you, and then he would be gone. The sharks weren't the only thing that the men had to contend with. They had to contend with exposure, dehydration. Um, if there are any medical people here, I know there was an army corpsman here. You can't drink salt water and live. But these men were dying of dehydration and yet surrounded, ironically, by water. And so as the days went on, they began to lose their faculties, and they began to think, well, maybe I can strain the salt out through my shirt. Or maybe if I just take a sip, it'll be OK. But these men actually would wind up losing their minds, and they would die very quick, painful deaths. And so it wasn't just the sharks that they had to contend with. They had to contend with all of these other things. And that's what it was like for five nights and four days. And it was on the early morning of the fourth day where a pilot by the name of Lieutenant Wilbur Gwynn was flying a routine patrol. And you know, many planes had flown by, but you have to imagine they're flying up where they can see an area of 400 square miles. And a head would look like less than the circumference of a hair. And so these men were invisible to the pilots. But on that fourth day, Lieutenant Gwynn was testing an antenna, and it kept breaking. And so finally went back to help his crew, and they open up the bottom, um, the bomb bay doors, and they, you know, they're kind of futzing with this antenna. And he looks down and he sees an oil slick, you know, and he's down at about 10,000 feet at this point. And he sees this, well, an oil slick is indicative of an enemy submarine. And so he gets, you know, he runs up to the front of the, the plane and he says, prepare the bomb, we're going to, you know, we're going to drop, there's an enemy submarine. And they go lower to drop the, 
the bomb on the this, this su suspected submarine, and he sees these bumps in the water. And he said it looked kind of like the bumps on a cucumber. And he said, what, what in the world? So they go down a little lower, and he sees men waving their arms. And, there's, and he said they were yelling and praying, anything they could do to get his attention. And they didn't, they didn't know who these men were. They didn't know if they were the enemy. They didn't know if they were American. There was no reports of any sinking, sunken vessels. Who are they? But he runs up to the front, and he calls in, ducks on the pond, ducks on the pond. And all of a sudden, these plane, you know, planes start coming in after a couple hours. Also, as Lynn mentioned earlier, the closest land is 280 miles away. So in order for a ship to get there, it's about 12 hours. And so this, you know, planes are coming in, and they're dropping supplies but these men in the water, they're not going to last much longer. And they don't, you know, they see right before them men still being taken by sharks. And then one of the pilots who showed up was, is it Lieutenant? Yeah, Lieutenant Adrian Marks, who, you know, he was a lawyer from Indiana, and he was a tough guy, and he kind of did what he wanted to do, but he followed the rules. And he, he shows up, and he does this routine patrol. I mean, this patrol where they're kind of seeing showing, assessing what's happening in the area, and Lieutenant Gwynn is showing him the different groups, because I had mentioned earlier, they're spread out over 25 miles. So they have some, the smaller groups in rafts, they have the men in life jackets, and it's like, you know, showing them who needs the most help. And as he's showing them this, men are being taken by sharks still. And Adrian says, we have to do something, we have to do something. Well, he's flying a PBY Catalina, and they're meant for open water, I mean, they're meant for water landings, but not open water landings, and certainly not 12-foot swell landings. But he decides he has to do something. And I know I met at least one aviator earlier. How many aviators do we have? I'm, I'm an ex-air traffic controller uh, back here in the back. So if you can imagine landing your fixed-wing aircraft on 12-foot swells, uh, this was not only dangerous, it was also strictly forbidden. Um, but when he saw those men still being taken by sharks, he was like, you know what, I have to do something. And so he decides to land, and this guy is, to me, one of the great heroes of the Indianapolis story. He lands that plane on the back of a 12-foot swell, and um, this is an incredibly dangerous maneuver, and the ocean just absolutely rejects the plane, just bounces it 15 feet back into the air. But Marx wrestles with the control column and finally lands that plane in the water. And he's able to rescue 53 men um, as a result. He's taxiing around, picking up the singles, um, not knowing that every man in the water has been there for five nights and four days. He thinks that the men who are um, in groups have a better chance of lasting until the ships come. Well, one of the ships that comes around midnight is the USS Bassett. And he, it was skippered by a man whose crew considered him basically a coward. His last name was Terrio. And uh, Terrio actually tries to flee the area at one point, but his crew won't let him. They actually escort him to his stateroom. They say, no way, we're not leaving here, sir, until we get all these men aboard. So Bassett launches LCVPs, which are small boats, and they go out in the dark, and the only thing, only lights they have are these battery-powered uh, battle lanterns. And a lot of the men are covered with fuel oil that has been released from the ship. That was the oil slick that Lieutenant Gwen saw. And so the men are, are dark, and they have white eyes. And so this ensign named Peter Wren comes up on this group of survivors and he holds up his battle lantern and all he can see are these dark faces and light eyes and he doesn't know if these are enemy or Americans. So he pulls out his sidearm and he points it at these guys and he says, who are you and what ship are you from? And some salty sailor who's been out there for five nights hollers back, just like a dumbass officer asking dumbass questions. <laughs> He said that's when he knew they were American sailors. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the rescue lasts about five days, and out of 1,195 men aboard Indianapolis, um, 320 were rescued. And if you can imagine this, four of them died after rescue, leaving only 316 who survived, including 
this young man's grandfather. He was in the raft group, I mean, not the raft group, the life jacket group, swimming for those five nights and four days. So, you know, these men, they were rescued, they were taken to a couple hospitals in Guam and the, in the Philippines, and eventually they were all brought to Guam. And at this time, they weren't allowed to talk about what happened. They were told to keep everything quiet. They were even told to write letters home as if the ship had never sunk. And so they would say, oh, I'm still on duty, you know, scraping barnacles or cleaning the decks when they were sitting in a hospital bed in Guam. And so this went on, and on August 6th, the first bomb was dropped. And that was the first time that they had heard what they had carried. They also found out, you know, the families found out via some, via telegram, but they didn't know that the Indianapolis had even sunk until on the 15th when it was announced, the war is over, Japan surrenders. And in small print on the bottom, underneath the fold, it said, USS Indianapolis sunk, 100% casualties. They didn't know at the time, or not everyone was familiar, that casualties also meant injured. But these families, that's how they first learned that their loved one, had, their ship had sunk. And so these families wanted answers, and they demanded to know who was responsible. Well, a court martial was called, ultimately called, after a court of inquiry, and for the first time, the Japanese commander of the submarine I-58 was brought to testify. No, no enemy had been brought to testify in a court martial against one of our own prior to this. Also, no captain had ever been brought to court martial for the loss of a vessel during wartime. And so these things were happening. They were start, starting to point finger. Who is it going to be? And ultimately, they did blame the captain for the sinking of Indianapolis. And then it took 50 years for his crew to get behind him and to exonerate him. But we're out of time, so you have to read the book to find out about that part. <laughs> Thank you. So we have a bunch of really good questions here. Oh, OK. Well, I'm going to, I'll read this. So my father, Alfred Jacobs, age 22, a naval supply officer in Guam, was tasked with reconstructing the payroll of Indianapolis since all records went down with the ship. Part of his duty included interviewing Captain McVeigh. My father never talked about how the payroll reconstruction was accomplished. Maybe after all of those years you can talk about this. I don't know that the, we don't know specifically about, where are you? I. I met you earlier. Oh, there you are. Yeah, we don't know specifically how the payroll was, uh, the, how the payroll reconstruction was accomplished. You know, in the military, as you, I'm sure you know, you're paid by your pay grade and how long you've been in. And so it's possible that they just retroactively said, you know, here was the last known payday, and they and they paid them forward from that. We do know that when the men arrived in San Diego, which was the first. Uh, shore, so, I mean, uh, stateside place that they landed after rescue, that many of them only had the shirts on their backs, and some of that was borrowed, and they they didn't really know how that they were going to get home or or make it. Um, we did know it was Lyle Umenhofer who had uh, actually saved his money right the whole time in the water. Well, and also they a couple of them were almost arrested because they were out of uniform. <laughs> and, so, and so they, you know, they didn't have any clothes and they would explain that they were on Indianapolis and first people wouldn't believe them. And then once they did, they, you know, took good care of them. But a lot of them had a hard time getting home. So we were just, uh, there was someone here who knows Al Salea, uh, uh, a gentleman over here. Al Salea is the youngest living survivor out of 316 who survived. There's only 12 who are alive today. And we were just with Al up in Seattle, and he was telling the story about how he had, um, when the ship sank, he had $47 in his locker. And so many of you may know that uh, uh, in August of 2017, the research vessel Petrol discovered the wreckage of Indianapolis at the center of the Philippine Sea at a depth of three and a half miles. And so the news outlets were interviewing survivors, how do you feel, how do you feel, and and this one reporter kept pressing Al, how do you feel, how do you feel, and he said, well, since they found the ship, do you think they could go down there and give me my $47 back? <laughs> this one's easy. Um, 
who broadcast my film. Um, I made a documentary with those interviews that um, came out in 2016, and it was a release in theaters, and it's now available on Amazon and Hulu and Netflix. So it's called USS Indianapolis, The Legacy, and if you have Amazon Prime, it's free. <laughs> Also should mention if you do stream it, Sarah makes 12 cents. So you don't even have to watch it. You know, you just push click and you know, no, watch it. <laughs> then the second time you don't have to watch it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Why was the Navy so intent on blaming McVeigh and not the ones who were actually culpable? Well, I think that's a great question, and it was it was a huge question that we went into this project with, because many of you may know that there have been other books written about Indianapolis. The first two major books, Abandoned Ship, which was written in 1958 or 59, and then Fatal Voyage, which was written by an Associated Press, Washington Post, um, really hardcore reporter in, uh, in 1990, both of those wrestled with that question. And so we were like, okay, we, we really hope that we can unravel this. What we found, and I can't remember if we found it, I know we found it at the National Archives in College Park, Maryland, was a memo from the Inspector General to Fleet Admiral Ernest King. King was one of the ones who was really pushing this court-martial agenda. And in this memo, for the first time that we had ever seen, no one had ever published it, there was a letter from, a memo from uh, the IG to King listing in bullet point fashion everyone who should have been culpable for Indianapolis and her sinking and the loss of those men. And McVeigh was not on the list. Um, but in those days, you may know that these admirals and these generals who won this war, this great, the, the biggest war that had ever engulfed the earth, they were rock stars. Those guys were signing autographs. I mean, after the war, there was a parade for Admiral Nimitz in New York City. Four million people turned out. And now, also, um, Pearl Harbor was still being adjudicated through the Navy legal system. And so we think, uh, based on that memo and based on what we knew about King, our analysis is they needed to Blame somebody, right? The families wanted answers, but they wanted to pin it at the lowest level and not uh, tarnish the names of these war heroes that had just brought peace to the world. This is totally off topic, but I want to add to the thing I forgot to mention earlier. Uh, Commander Hashimoto, who was brought to the court-martial to testify, at the time, he gave his testimony to say that no matter what would have happened, I would have sunk Indianapolis. It didn't matter if I zigzagged or not. And the translator did not translate that. He spoke, or he did not speak English well enough to convey this, but he understood it well enough. And he said that was one of his greatest regrets. And so later on when the exoneration process did happen, he actually wrote a letter to Senator Warner just pleading that he would exonerate McVeigh, that he would finally clear his name after this years. And that was really one of the catalysts that helped in the exoneration process of McVeigh. So I thought that was a really cool part of the story. Do you know how the second atomic bomb, the plutonium bomb, Fat Boy, was delivered to the South Pacific? Plane. The end. No, okay. um, they, they did take that, the plutonium, via plane because they wanted, you know, they took the uranium ship, plane was the other option, and they knew that they would have um, at least one that would get there. And the interesting thing was is that dropping um, Little Boy on the 6th and uh, Fat Man on the 9th was calculated, it was psychological warfare. It was calculated to suggest to Emperor Hirohito and his uh, staff that the United States had an unlimited supply of these weapons and would just systematically incinerate Japan, but really there were only two. I think we have two left, so I'll look through again. Okay, what do you think about the movies that have been made? I saw one on Netflix a year or two ago. What did they leave out? 
do you think, oh, what do you think, what did they leave out that you think should have been told? The true story. <laughs> <laughs> um, there have been movies made. There was one made with Stacy Keach in the 90s called, um, geez. I totally just blanked on that. It was with Stacy Keach. It was after the Super Bowl, and um, I actually met one of the peop the producers on it recently, and he had read our book, and he said, "Wow, we really got it wrong." <laughs> and so I thought that he's like, "If you ever make it again, let us know." Which, by the way, we are currently in the process of working on. So, um, but yeah, there there have been other projects that have tried to tell the story of Indianapolis, and they. We don't feel that they have done it justice, and I don't believe the survivors feel they've done it justice. So they've never actually worked with any of the survivors while making the movies. So, you know. That and was par a part of the problem is, is that, you know, the Nicolas Cage movie that came out in 2016 and then the Stacey Keach movie, you can't, if you read, if, for those of you who've read the book and those of you who will, you can't make this story in a two hour feature. You just can't. And. You know, Band of Brothers was the gold standard of, of miniseries, but now limited series happen all, the, happen all the time. So that's what we're working on. We're trying to tell it in a, in a multi-episode uh, format. We have one person that's going to go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I, I'm going to read this one, and then I'll hand it to you, make sure I didn't miss any. But the basic design of the ship seems to have been some seems to have had some serious different, I'm so sorry. Um, I think it's deficiencies, sorry, the writing, um, that make it significantly vulnerable to submarine attack. Comments? Indianapolis was designed with a single through deck, and um, this was a known deficiency. Um, when Indianapolis would, if, if your Navy in here, um, surface ships and, you know, subsurface ships as well, um, operate under different uh, damage control conditions. So that's a different amount of um, water tightness, if you will. So different hatches and different scuttles are sealed or left open depending on what the operating conditions are, whether you know, whether you're at general quarters and under attack. If you are, then you're going to be buttoned all the way up. If you're uh, Army or Air Force in here tonight, or maybe even Marine Corps, um, a ship is designed to, so that you can um, isolate damaged portions of the ship and make the rest of the ship watertight. Well, this particular kind of cruiser was uh, designed with this single through deck all, all the way through. And it was a known hazard because in order to operate efficiently and allow um, efficient passage of the crew from to their various watch stations, they had to leave it less watertight than it should have been. And that definitely uh, contributed to the demise of Indianapolis because when she was hit, the flooding was just immediate all the way through the ship. She was also a treaty cruiser, and so her hull was actually built thinner than the ships that were built later on. They had the, 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 the treaty in place so that nobody had the advantage, and so these ships were meant for speed, and so they took weight off by making the, the hull and the, um, but the inner wall, the soup, thank you, the superstructure thinner, and so, it, it was said that Admiral, Admiral Nimitz said if she ever got hit by a torpedo, it would go through her like hot butter. And so, and that's exactly what happened. The torpedoes went in and ripped off the bow. And so it did help with her speed. She was one of the fastest ships there were, but it also was contributing to why she sank so quickly. And we've been given the last question sign by Colonel Kearney. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Before, uh, before we close out this evening's presentation, and I am very respectful of their common comment because they were running out of time with their narrative, uh, that you need to read the book. The book is absolutely superb. But I want to ask one question because I think it should tug at your heartstrings. What happened 
to Captain McVeigh. Well, 879 families thought that McVeigh was responsible for the sinking of Indianapolis because, why? Because the Navy said he was responsible. And so after the sinking, some of those families started to write him letters and they would come on Christmas or the anniversary of the sinking or the birthday of a loved one who was lost and they would say things like, if it wasn't for you, I'd be celebrating Christmas with my son. If it wasn't for you, my girls would have a father. These letters continued from 1945 to 1968. Uh, they would come in rivers at first, and then they would decrease, but they never stopped. And in 1968, Captain McVeigh took a revolver and took his own life. Um, he couldn't take it. He actually did come to one reunion where he was able to meet the men, and he was terrified. He said that the men had said that he was so nervous about meeting them because of the guilt that he carried. And he didn't expect it, but when he arrived for that reunion, the men all lined up, and someone yelled, Captain on deck, and they all saluted to the man. And when he took his life, all those men got behind him, and they're the reason why he was exonerated 50 years later, because they fought for their captain. They didn't feel he was guilty, and they knew that his name had to be restored. These ladies have done a superb job in writing a book that is, uh, again, there's, there's multiple stories, multiple complex stories, and I'd commend the book to you uh, for an absolutely enjoyable and informative read. Uh, please join me in a round of applause to thank these women. <laughs> Ladies, thanks very much. Thank you.